Welcome to the Hangar Deck Podcast. We bring amazing aviation talk and interviews for the aviation enthusiast. You are listening to www.thehangardeck.com with host Pitch Lock P and the Hangar Deck Crew. This show is brought to you by Leading Edge Aviation Consultants. Pre-flight is complete and the crew is strapping in. Stand by for Pitch Lock Pete and the Hangar Deck team at the Hangar Deck Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Hangar Deck Podcast. Hey, welcome back to this episode of the Hangar Deck Podcast. Uh, you know, it's 8 o'clock on June 13, 2018, and it's been a great spring. I, I, I cannot, I, I just... You, I'm. You can hear me. I'm full of anxiety because, uh, you know, I got producer Steve has organized the hangar deck like nobody has organized it before. Uh, we've got releases of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. Um, you could check out our website. Um, those those episodes were approaching 100, and I got to say thank you, producer Steve. Uh, are you on the line, Steve? I am. Yeah, yeah. You 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 were remote right now organizing the show, aren't you? Absolutely. I need to go around the country and get some more people to have on the show. <laughs> I meet them in person. Yeah, you know what? You you've done uh you know, Steve has reached out to everyone potential in the aviation industry to include Richard Branson, haven't you, Steve? I have, and I, I did get an email back, but it was the canned email that he sends back to everyone. But I haven't given up yet. We're gonna try to get him on the show. Don't don't give up on me, man. I want to have Richard Branson dialed in. Um, <laughs> that's great. You know, last couple of weeks we were. It's been busy. It's been a busy spring. We were we're watching all of the air show network and the Warbird network this spring. It's been a wet spring, so some of the shows didn't go over as well as planned. But we did make it down to Warbirds over the beach. At the Military Aviation Museum, you got to go check out those guys down there. Of course, I'm going to plug them every single time because it's amazing what Jerry Yagen and team do for aviation down there. And then, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> of course, two weeks ago, uh, we had right in our backyard in Southern Maryland, uh, here at uh, in Lexington Park, Naval Air Station, Pax River Air Expo went down. You know, go check out that expo, uh, that 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 episode because I, I was able to talk one on one with the base skipper, one on one with Shara from the Warrior Flight Team, and you know with with his L thirty nines, and then one on one, nobody else in the room. Rob Holland, seven time aerobatic world champion, and myself sat down and had a real you know good conversation about his routines, how he does stuff. And, and it's just what a pleasure to sit down and talk to Rob. Um, and, and by the way, that Wednesday night before the air show, I had a half hour conversation with Patty Wagstaff. Go check out that episode. Uh, you know, unbelievable, uh, a six time world champion there. Uh, you know, go, go check out aerobatic pilot packet, Patty Wagstaff on our, on, on our episode. So, now and we gotta thank Cash Cash too, because he was on the show. He helped find up all these interviews, got us over there, talked to those people. So we have to thank Cash over there at the uh Naval Air Station for helping um, coming on the show, telling us what it took to get this whole air expo together and you got some more interviews that that day. Yeah, yeah, dude. I'm telling you, Cash, uh the local air traffic control uh, officer in charge of the tower is also, uh, you know, in charge of the air show. He came in, into the studio personally in uniform and delivered a great message for, for the air show. So props out the cash. So here we are. It's the, it's the 13th of June. We're coming up on, on the season of summer. Um, you know, I got to give props to producer Steve. He reached out to a friend in his network and he has, he has graciously joined us tonight and I want to introduce before before we get this guy on. Let me tell you who he is. A little about him. Okay, he was a chief warrant officer, aviator, U.S. Army in 1968 to 1972. I was born in 1970, so that gives you a hint. All right, 
He was the chief pilot of research and development for Sikorsky Aircraft for over 24 years. Okay, this he was a test pilot and he logged over 7,500 hours of flight time and over 70 different types of helicopters. We have him on the show tonight. And I got to tell you, the former director of the S-92 program at Sikorsky. Uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Nick Lapis. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, Nick, it, it, your resume and your biography are phenomenal. Um, you know, and, and thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, can you give us a little bit of more detailed background of your aviation, uh, uh, you know, career? Sure. And let me tell you, too, the, 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 uh, the resume sounds impressive, but I must tell you, um, what it really amounts to is being at the right place at the right time and hanging around with the right folks. And, and if there's one thing I can say about my career, I've been wondrously blessed by being able to work with some real champs. The unit I flew with in Vietnam, the folks at the Sikorsky Pilots Office, even the folks at the Georgia Tech Flying Club. Uh, everywhere I went, I found communities of terrific pilots who, uh, who uh, you know, stayed safe, stayed sharp, and made themselves better every day. And, and if, if uh, there's a list of things that I've happened to be able to touch and see, uh, it's like uh, being at the outside of the bakery and somebody lets the door open so you can smell the bread. <laughs> it's fantastic for me. And I'm, I'm just now semi-retired from Sikorsky, and it's given me a chance to reflect on all these things, too. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I mean, you know, when you first started thinking about aviation, when was that? Obviously, it's before 1968, right? Oh, yeah. In fact, you know, it's interesting. My dad was a bomber crew in the 8th Air Force in World War II, and he used to tell my brother and I stories about uh, flying out of England, uh, going off over Germany. Uh, and, and I got to sense what air power is and what aviation is. And so from the earliest times, I, I recall that. And, uh, and then we, uh, we happened to live in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is the home of Sikorsky Aircraft. And um, when I was a youngster, I mean, literally seven years old or so, down on the beach, um, which is not too far away from a plant that existed at South Avenue in Bridgeport at that time. Uh, and, and I ran away from the blanket and headed across a big grass field and ended up against the, uh, the chain link fence watching the helicopters hover. And, of course, my mother thought I drowned, so my parents were in a panic. And then finally my father looks the 400 yards across the field and sees me glued to the fence. Uh, and, and at that age, I guess it was kind of like those young ducks that get imprinted. Um, I couldn't stay away. And interestingly, about uh, if you think about the timing, when I was 24 years old, I was back at Sikorsky, and those same people who were hovering the helicopters in that field getting ready to deliver them to the Army, those folks helped check me out in the Sikorsky models. Oh, wow. So it's, a, it's, a, it, it's in my blood, I guess, and, and part of it is because uh, it's, it's adventure. And, and I, every one of your people who listens to the podcast knows that. We all know in aviation that we do it not just because it's fun to fly and not just because it's hard and someone has to do a hard job, but also because it's the place today where you can find adventure. That's un uh, uh, incredible. Thank you, Nick, for saying that. You know, what goes through my mind is, uh, you know, it sounds like you're, you're a heritage and a history guy, and uh, that, that's some, some really great stuff. Uh, have, have you talked or, or seen um, with anybody up at the Connecticut Air and Space Center? Yes, in fact, uh, um, I have. <clears throat> I, I don't directly participate, but a couple of the aircraft that are in there were rebuilt by Sikorsky retirees. I know. That VS-44, for example. And, um, and, I, and I know that crew very, very well. Um, helped a little bit, not very much, but mostly, uh, mostly by uh, donations and, and bringing people from the public in to watch as they did their jobs. We what, a, what a great museum that is. Yeah, I know. We recently did a, uh, a piece with those guys on the Corsair that used to sit outside of Sikorsky. Uh, do you remember the Corsair on a stick out there? Yeah, I do. In fact, I, I think I visited that. It's down at the, uh, at the South Avenue plant. The, um, um, I'm sorry, the Stratford plant. Near the, in Vought-Sikorsky, it's being rebuilt right now. I saw it last about uh, four months ago, five months ago. Oh, wow. We did, an, we yeah. did a piece with the guys up there, and, uh, you know, they sent us all kinds of pictures about it. I didn't realize it was on a stick outside of Sikorsky for years. And uh, Yeah, well, actually, it was, uh, it's the Sikorsky Airport. It was down at the, uh, and that makes it doubly worse, because it was out in the salt air on a peninsula that hangs out over Long Island Sound and next to a salt marsh. So, unfortunately, on the stick... 
and without special corrosion protection, it really it really got some damage done, and it's taken quite something to get it restored back up again. Well, kudos to those guys, and uh, you know, yeah. I, I know it's a segue. <laughs> so, um, so what after the war? After you know you got out of the army, uh, what what made you want to be a test pilot for Sikorsky? Well, you know, I, I I knew that I loved flying, and I also knew that I didn't know enough about it. And having flown uh, and getting a uh, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand hours and a bunch of combat time, I realized that I wanted to find out what made the machines tick. So when I when I left the army, I went back to college, and I started off as a freshman and worked my way through Georgia Tech and got an aerospace engineering degree. Um, I actually didn't think about being a test pilot. I thought I was going to be a design engineer, or whatever. And uh, when I graduated, uh, they, there's an interview process that you go through, and the Sikorsky representatives came down, and one of them was the head of flight test. And when he saw my resume and saw that I'd flown helicopters and I now was also a graduate engineer, he said, have you thought about being a test pilot? And, and I looked him straight in the eye and I said, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you <laughs> always he, say he yes, said, right? Yeah, you betcha. And, and so he said, look, I'd like to have you meet as another fellow. That I want you to come back tomorrow if you can. We set up a date. And I met the, the head recruiter for Sikorsky, the guy who headed up the human resources organization. And they agreed that they would uh, interview me for a test pilot. And, uh, and at that point, I, I came up to the plant and, and met with the test pilots and talked to them. It took a little while to get an opening in the pilot's office because they were waiting for, believe it or not, at that time, they were waiting for the first big contract that led to the Black Hawk and Apache. Okay. And so I, I was actually hired by Sikorsky as one of the junior test pilots to help uh, run uh, the flight testing for the, uh, the Black Hawk. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's crazy awesome. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, what, what are we looking at? 1980, 1990? What is the Black uh, Hawk actually, program in the 70s? I joined Sikorsky in 1973. Oh, wow. So, and here's something interesting. When I joined Sikorsky in 73, if you just do the math, 30 years earlier than we were talking about 1943, those are the folks that built the first helicopter. Right. So I had a chance to rub shoulders with and hear stories from the folks who built the first helicopter. Oh, my and God. Four, 40 years earlier than 1973 was 1933, and that's when they were building the Sikorsky flying boats that went all around the world. I love it. And I met and talked to the folks who designed and built and flew the flying boats and the first helicopters. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to be, I told you, is, is that, that watching people bake the bread, get to smell it. Uh, I met people who were wonderfully experienced at the development of the first helicopters, the first flying boats, the, uh, the first machines to fly across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Unbelievable uh, uh, legacy at Sikorsky. Well, those guys are, are the frontier. That, that, that those, you're, you're describing the frontiers of helicopter aviation and flying boat aviation. That's incredible. I love it. Um, yeah, it, was, it was so much fun. And I must tell you that, uh, uh, you know, we're in those ages now. The people who are living now would look back and say, gosh, I missed that. But no, they didn't, because the UAVs are the same thing right this very second. And people are, are breaking ground in other ways. Uh, you know, Elon Musk and the, and, the, and the rockets that he's building are magnificent uh, examples of American ingenuity. It goes on every day. So I, I advise everyone who's listening to this podcast to look for the strange new things that seem a bit strange. And then if, you're, if you really want to get involved in that adventure of changing things, Go, go run to that and, and see what you can do to contribute. So let's talk about when you did join Sikorsky. You did talk to all these guys. You were on that UH, 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 the Black Hawk program. Was that the first aircraft that you were a test pilot on? Yeah, it was actually the first one that did any experimental flying. And at that time, I was an experimental co-pilot, so uh, that's how you learn the ropes. Uh, basically, what manufacturers test pilots do is very different than anyone else uh, and, and the development of a new machine takes an awful lot of engineering horse sense. And I learned from some genuine pros, uh, some people who had been uh, across that bridge. Heck, uh, Byron Graham was the chief experimental test pilot when I joined the pilot's office. Byron was a Corsair pilot in World War II. He knew oh, Pappy wow. Boynton. Yeah. He, he knew and Pappy Byron Boynton? Also flew. I know. And, <laughs> and I, I, I worked with him every day. Byron checked me out in one of the, one of the Sikorsky models. What a, what a terrific guy. What a what a curmudgeon in one way, and what a great engineer in another, and so it was a, it was a fantastic opportunity to fly with him. Um, and, and I learned some tales too. Another fellow I flew with was a fellow named Cliff Brown, and Cliff was one of the first Air Force rescue helicopter pilots. 
in Korea. Wow. And, uh, and, I, and Cliff, Cliff had a nickname, No Sweat Brown. And I, I asked where he got that from, and he wouldn't tell me because he was, he was more modest. Right. But uh, one, of, one of the other pilots told me the story, and it, it turned out to be true. Cliff was flying in, in, in basically an S-51. S-52 was the, the wide-bodied version that was for, uh, an Air Force rescue in, in Korea. Right. And in the early 1950s, he was sprung on a mission to go pick up a fighter pilot who had been shot down in enemy territory. And a bunch of A-1s followed him in to protect him. And, of course, they're bombing and, and whacking the bad guys as, uh, as Cliff lands in the landing zone where this pilot is laying under a bush with his pistol out, you know, hoping he doesn't get captured. And as the pilot backs his way into the helicopter and jumps in the seat, he looks over, and Cliff is gone. What? It had taken long enough to fly out to this pickup point that Cliff had to go to the bathroom. So, <laughs> so he unstrapped himself, friction the controls, gets out... <laughs> And walks over and pees on a bush. It <laughs> comes back and sits in the aircraft, and this fighter pilot's looking at him and says, "My God, how can you do that?" And Cliff looks and says, "No sweat, man. We're, everything's okay." That's <laughs> he where he got his up. right. <laughs> it's right. He flew back to the, uh, to the the squadron, landed the guy on the ramp where, where, they, where they, the uh, his buddies picked him up and, and carried him off because he's you know he he survived. And uh, that night they wet Cliff Brown down and gave him his nickname, No Sweat Brown. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That, that, that's how you get your call signs is from experiences like yeah. that. You know, absolutely. It's un, it, it's incredible. So we're we're talking to uh, uh, Sikorsky test pilot, senior guy uh, for Sikorsky for years. We'll be back right after this brief message from the uh, Hangar Day podcast. Aviators Hotline has been bringing buyers and sellers together for thirty nine years. The aviation community has come to rely on them to assist in the buying and selling of single, twin, and turboprop aircraft, as well as parts and services. Published monthly in print and digital format, Aviators Hotline is positioned to be your true marketing solution with multimedia options. Visit aviatorshotline.com or aircraftforsale.com for more information. Hey, we're back, and uh, we're back in the studio. It's June 13th, twenty. 20- 18 and uh what a what a what a guest tonight uh we got uh sikorsky test pilot mr nick lapos and uh, we're having a great conversation about uh well history which is one of our favorite topics uh we'd like to take a, a trip down uh aviation history lane and and talking about uh you know sikorsky times and test pilots and what makes what makes aviation so special so thanks nick for joining us again Oh, it's my pleasure. It's so, my pleasure. Um, you know, what's it like to get into a helicopter for the first time as a test pilot? I mean, y- y- you're over 30 years now since uh, you were on the Black Hawk program. Um, what was what was it like? Yeah. Yeah, and also the S-76. In fact, I trained on the Black Hawk and then spun off to, to work the S-76 project. I, I flew the first flight and the structural shakedown on the 76, got to know it very well. And then went from there on to uh, some of the other Sikorsky models between there uh, and some of the experimental prototypes that were used to prove out the concepts for Comanche. Uh, we, we made a, a one aircraft that was a modified S-76 that had a bulbous nose on it that was an extra cockpit. And that extra cockpit had fly-by-wire controls that went back to the parent aircraft. So it was like a flying simulator. Wow. And, and uh, I flew a bunch of these things. They All of them give you the same feeling to answer your question directly pete when you get into an aircraft for the first time you are the first person and you've got to be careful and you've got to you got to look to fly it uh gently and gingerly until it, you get to know it and you have to recognize something there's nowhere to hide there's 10 people in a telemetry room watching every single trace right. there's uh, there are people standing outside and you got fire engines standing by and you are responsible for that airplane and it is an amazing um, responsibility that sits on your shoulders because not only is it you're flying this airplane and it's your, and it's, you know, it's your hide, but you also have a program. There might be a program that's it's a half a billion dollar program yeah. for which there'll be three prototypes. And if you bang up one of them, not only did you stop the show for a year while we study it, but you've also set the program back. It's, right. it's an enormous responsibility. So you feel all that stuff too. But if you let that rattle, you're, you're, you're made of the wrong stuff. <laughs> Go we'll have some fun. Well, Nick, Nick, you're made of the right stuff, and uh, you know I'm, I'm just listening and digesting everything that you're talking about. You know I'm a uh, I'm a rescue swimmer back in the Navy, 
And, uh, you know, I flew the H3 and, uh, you know, we talked before we went on air about, uh, you know, Sikorsky helicopters, but, you know, I can't, I can't remember when it was, whether it was 10, 15 or even 17 years back, it may be not that long ago, but the Comanche, I saw a discovery channel show on the Comanche and I was enamored by that whole, (laughs) that whole program. And then it never came. It never came to light. Um, yeah, what a disappointment for us. But I'll tell you, um, we work for our customers. You know, when you make a better bagel and you sell it, right? And you make money on it, then you're happy. And if the customers don't buy it, then you go try another bagel. Well, that bagel was I, a delicious bagel. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great helicopter. And in fact, I see some things on the internet where people think that that the cancellation of the Comanche program was because the helicopter didn't do its job. No. The team of uh, Sikorsky and Boeing did a fantastic job. It was the fastest helicopter. It was the highest G helicopter. I could do, if you can believe this, we could fly along at 100 knots and turn the aircraft around on its axis. What? That is to say, a northbound helicopter at 100 knots could point southbound while still going northbound at 100 knots. (laughs) You know how you talk about super maneuverable fighters that can break high alpha and point their weapons. The Comanche did that. It did all those things very, very well. Now, what, it, what did it not do? Well, the Comanche was designed for a Cold Warrior stealth helicopter right. in, in, in European environments against Russian tanks. Right. And, and that world had changed. And quite frankly, we also got ourselves involved, dragged in screaming, involved with the wars in the desert that were very necessary and that spent a lot of money. Yep. And therefore, the future weaponry, uh, the Crusader Cannon was another example of a, of, a, of a cancel program, a very good machine that did its job well, like Comanche, but uh, the customer didn't need that brand of SUV. Right. The customer needed something else then, and so we have to recognize that. And, of course, uh, you know, technology, you know, from, from back when the Comanche was developed to even now is, is uh, leaps and bounds with uh, oh, drones and UAVs. Yeah. So That's right. That's right. I'm sure that's an impact too on uh, or or might not be back then but sure would be now. Uh, well, we're going into a whole new world too and and I think pilots the folks listening to the podcast have to understand why the world wants to see unpiloted vehicles. And the answer is that if you look at the expense to fly a machine, a great deal of it is the human and then if you look at the places where you might be able to do routine missions without a person, uh, computing power and sensors have pulled us into that world. And so it's, it's a very natural place to be. Uh, and I'll invite you to think about this. When you go to Atlanta Airport, uh, how many people move to Atlanta Airport on a day? Is it a million people? I, I think there's a number like that out there. Right. They drive themselves in trains in the basement that have no human operators. Right. What's the difference between a train that moves in one axis and a helicopter that moves in three? And the difference is more computing power, and that's all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we're not uh, we're not programmed yet to accept all this UAV drone technology, and that's a that's another episode. Um. Yeah, it sure is. (laughs) You know, let me I'll do a plug if I can for advanced controls and fly by wire. You got the floor, Nick. You got the floor, and then they wonder. Okay, great. If people talk about fly-by-wire and ask why, why would I have a computer control my airplane? And the answer is that if it were just to do what we do today, you don't need the computer and you shouldn't rely on it. But instead, what the computer does is it changes the entire control feel of the helicopter. It changes it all. And in doing so, it means that the stick no longer behaves like the stick of a regular helicopter. You no longer have to balance uh, the helicopter like a broom and be uh, super finessed at, at recognizing one degree attitude change and adjusting that. And, by the way, losing that uh, control of the one degree attitude change um, when you're into a degraded visual environment, when you get into a dust cloud or something, you know, that's a real problem. But when you have fly-by-wire, it's entirely possible to change the laws so that the average person can drive the helicopter like you drive a car. And it means that you can then hand the job to people who are minimally trained. They're, they don't have to be super aviators, and, that, and they'll get the job done. That's that's you're describing. My my, I'm computing this right now, and that's the future of aviation for normal commerce or normal commuting. Um, you know, making it easier for everybody to understand how to fly. Yeah, and let me offer two examples in the world 
first one, elevators. When I was a kid in New York City in Macy's department store, there was always a really nice small man or woman with a pillbox hat and white gloves who controlled the elevator. You couldn't trust micro switches in the 40s and 50s to open and close the doors, which is a man-rated, you know, potentially very hazardous job. If the door opens up on an empty uh, uh, elevator shaft, people can walk into a hole. And so you, you have to have it sequenced very properly. And these people would fly the elevator each floor. They'd actually have a floor marker through a slot in the door and drive it with an up-down lever until it reached the marker properly. Right. Then open the inner door, open the outer door, let people out. Let people in, close the outer door, close the inner door, door, and then drive to the new location. That elevator operator is no longer there because electronics have become safe enough that we now can have elevators that don't have accidents. How far away do you I, think, Nick? How far away do you think we are? Well, you know what? It's, it's around the corner. We're finding uh, uh, aircraft today that have these advanced fly-by-wire controls that can be flown by non-pilots. And I think that the biggest questions we'll have are, how do the entrepreneurs who love to do this thing mix with the FAA people who have to protect the public? Right. You can't, you can't let these things fly over a populated city like Chicago or New York and have them fall into a, you know, into a school. That, that can't be. So there has to be the degree of assurance and safety, and that's what the FAA is good at. So we'll, we'll, I think we're five years away from having maybe three. And by the way, every time somebody says something like this, somebody else disproves it. Hmm. Um, but we're you know, that far away from having a genuine, uh, purposeful machine that can fly over a city and do a job. Well, and, and I, I think, I think, that close. yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. I think, uh, the ads be out, uh, you know, compliancy in 2020 is, is part of this and the next gen air transportation system, uh, to support what you're talking about. Um, you yeah. know, yeah. if we're going to clobber the, uh, the airways, you know, with more air traffic, they've got to get their act together first. It's absolutely true. In fact, what, what we find is that an awful lot of what's happening uh, in the world today is driven by the airlines because that's where the money is. Right. It's an enormous industry that gets lots of turnover. And we in the helicopter world uh, don't have anywhere near the same turnover. The entire helicopter operations in the United States, all of the offshore oil and EMS and, and all those good functions, do not equate to the passenger carrying of one medium-sized airline. Right. So, so we, we have a ways to go. Right. But I do believe that the UAV world is going to break open. I think there's going to be hundreds and hundreds more aircraft as we start to move into the world where the economics, uh, the economics of electric helicopters are magnificent. There's no parts. Yeah. You know, the, the transmission we've got. You know, the, 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 the electric helicopters are, are the, the future, and it's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that, I think. Tesla of the skies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's go back to... Uh, to, to your flying days of, uh, you know, when you were a test pilot, what's the mood when you're in a brief around the ready room as you're, you're about to climb into maybe an airplane for the first time or a helicopter for the first time? Um, you know, what's that, what's that mood like? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I would liken test flying, when it, we talk about really experimental test flying, is very similar to um, exploring a minefield. It's almost exactly the same. The object is to find the mines before they go off. Right. And you have to recognize that the machine you've got, and the engineer, uh, design engineers are terrific. The people who make the engines and hydraulics and electrical and transmissions are great at their jobs. And they're probably about 98% accurate. So if you think about the 2%, that's what we're worried about. <laughs> and, and the trick is to find that 2% by the telltale signs it gives you before they take over the airplane. Is it safe to say, is it safe to say, Nick, that, you know, you execute a flight test plan and uh, there are, I don't know, there, there, there's a, a margin of error there that it doesn't go right. You know, can you, can you explain when it doesn't go right? Yeah, and, and what you hope that is, is a disruption in your flight plan and not an emergency. You know, to, to the extent that you, you can find these things because you have instrumentation and telemetry that allows 10 observers. The helicopter may only be a 10,000-pound machine that's 50 feet long. You can't put those people in the machine. Right. But we can then put sensitive uh, sensors that detect the pressures and temperatures and stresses and the vibrations. 
and 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 report them down and look for thresholds where if a threshold is exceeded, uh, you do what's called a build-up program, where you don't do the most uh, uh, outrageous maneuvers first. You start off gently and just literally sit there and hover, and then advance from a hover out to 20, 40, 60 knots. Mostly it's a build-up program, building up in airspeed, building up in gross weight, building up in CG, and building up in altitude. Right. And then lastly, building up a maneuver. And so what you do is you step like the minefield uh, through each step, and if you see a bad parameter, you have to explain it. So when, when in the test flight plan do you do a loop? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's funny. I, I have done them, and, and uh, mostly it's great because it's good for bragging rights at the bar, but most <laughs> helicopters don't need those maneuvers. Quite frankly, airplanes don't need them now anymore either because mostly the sensors and weapons are, are dominant in air battle. Right. But, uh, but it makes you feel better. When you look at the... You look at Chuck Aaron fly the Red Bull helicopter. You realize that there's a, it, there's a it's a thrill to it. I I've done those maneuvers in Sikorsky's. I've done them flying with uh, some great uh, German pilots in the MBB family, and uh, I can tell you it's a, it's a thrill. And it's not only a thrill, it's um, uh, it's very unusual to be able to uh, do what Chuck Aaron does. I love it. I so, love it. Yeah. yeah. So I also think that your uh, speed records are something to brag about, far right too. So what, what three helicopters, and what were those speeds that you got up to? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, we, we, uh, I was working for the president of Sikorsky on a special project, and, and I went to him and I said, you know, the S-76, we, we had just finished doing the flight test development of 76, and we had certified the, the basic airplane. And I said, this machine is a world beater. And, uh, and he said, tell me, I, I laid out the, the world records that existed and showed that in a four-day period, uh, we could break 12 world records because the machine simply just like rolling off a log, it was that good. And so what we did is we funded the program, got a, a, one of our prototype aircraft, and, and set up a, a team at West Palm Beach who reviewed all the data, and we flew and practiced these things. And as I, I said earlier, you're looking at the, uh, you know, trying to find the mine before, before it goes off. So we had data to tell us what was going on. And then the big event came. We had a four-day period, and in those four days we, we flew uh, uh, speeds, and the way speeds go is you have uh, a three kilometer record, a 15 to 25 kilometer record, and then you go the 100 kilometers and 500 kilometers. And we took all of those. <laughs> and uh, we did, uh, typically the aircraft flew about 200 and, 210 to 215 miles an hour doing all those maneuvers. Oh my God. And then uh, we also did time to climb for altitude. Um, and uh, the, the, the sum total of them, because we the aircraft straddled two weight classes so we could get the record for uh, 6,600 pounds just below that and just above 6,600 pounds. They, they, they classified as the uh, E1D and E1E records, and so we did those. And that meant that everyone I just mentioned is actually two records because we could fly just literally a couple hundred pounds above or below that number. Wow. And we did it all in four days. And what we did, too, is because it was so much fun, we spread it out among the pilots in the pilot's office. So everyone got a chance to set a few records. <laughs> That's great. That's uh, that's crazy awesome. Uh, you know, my jaw has dropped. <laughs> you have so many great stories. Uh, is there any one story that, that pokes out in your head? Can, that... I, can I tell you one of my favorite test pilot stories? <clears throat> when I came to the pilot's office, I was hired by the chief pilot at Sikorsky, who was Pete Everest, Frank K. Everest. And I invite the, 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 the listeners to, uh, to look him up. Pete wrote a book. He was the fastest man alive. He was, he was uh, Chuck Yeager's right-hand man and took over when Chuck Yeager got old enough. Uh, so Pete was the, the, the guy who ran the Edwards Air Force Base uh, organization, test organization. And he was hired by Sikorsky to help uh, set up uh, the flight test program for, uh, for Sikorsky. And then he hired me. And, and I happened to go down to NASA Langley uh, Research Center and do a small project with a, with a helicopter down there. And while I was there, I met a NASA senior test pilot named Bob Champagne. Now, I really invite folks to look Bob Champagne up because he did everything. And Champagne said he flew the Bell X-1, and, and the, the fastest airplane at the time. And he, he just wanted me to say hi to Pete Everest from him. And I said, I'll be glad to do that, Bob. This is great. So I go back to Stratford, and I come in the, the, that next morning, and I said, hey, Pete, by the way, Bob Champagne says hi. 
and he says champagne, and he says some you know really foul words. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> he seemed like a really nice guy. He said he is a great guy, but he cost us a flight. And I said, what do you mean? Well, the champagne was in the belly of the B-50, the modified B-29, right. in the Bell X-1. And if you've seen the pictures, you know that the machine is pushed right up into the belly oh, yeah. where the oh, bomb yeah. bay was. Yeah. And so they climb up to about 30,000 feet, and champagne's inside the aircraft, and he can't get his intercom to work, and he can't get his radios to work. Oh, he has no. no communication with the outside world. And it, it probably was a bug somewhere in the intercom box, but, but a bug is a bug. And he's got this thing fueled up, and he can't drop without having communication with telemetry and everyone else. Well, this is where the story diverges. Champagne was a Navy test pilot. Uh -oh. The people on board the bomber are Air Force okay. slash Army, right? Yep. So Champagne has to figure a way to tell the crew chief, and the crew chief's looking through the windows, and, and Champagne's trying to talk. They can't hear a thing. So Champagne takes his test cards and flips them over and writes on the back of them, secure the launch. Because in Navy lingo, and you know this, Pete, yep. secure means stop something. Right. Right? In the Army and the Air Force, when something's secure, it means it's all set. <laughs> so he says, secure the launch on the piece of paper. And the Air Force crew chief looks at him, gives him a thumbs up, and drops him. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> A fully loaded Bell X-1 <laughs> whistles down. With no communications. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. And he can't start the engines. He's got no telemetry. He's got nothing. He doesn't know what he has. So he dumped fuel all the way down and made an emergency landing on the lake bed. No damage to the aircraft, nothing. But, of course, it took weeks to get set up for a flight. So, so because oh. of the word secure the launch, and because the Army thinks secure means good, and the Navy knows secure means bad, yeah. that's why they drop them. And I, when I heard this story, I couldn't believe it. And I, quite frankly, I've been telling this tale because these, the, the, the two guys, I called Champagne up and talked to him about it. He's, oh, God, I knew Pete had mentioned that. And, and it's on the Internet. Champagne put it in his notes, his NASA test pilot notes. So what you do is just Google Bob Champagne Secure. And one of the first three hits is going to be his logs to talk about that mission. Oh my God, Bob! Shan oh my God, secure! I am I am going to Google that when we're done here. And and, and look by the up. way, there's stories like that for every program. Oh my God! Every that's, pro that's, we flew the first flight on the F seventy six. I flew with John Dixon, the dean of Sikorsky test pilots, and John was my mentor. And and we're we're trying to get the airplane in the air, but our instrumentation died. We had no instrumentation in the aircraft at all. And the chairman of the United Technologies, the president of Sikorsky Aircraft, the vice president of engineering, our boss, everyone's standing on the runway watching us. And we're sitting there like dopes for 45 minutes, ground running, trying to figure out how to get the instrumentation back on again. And so I looked at John, and he looked at me. And then he looked at me, and I looked at him. And John just slowly turned his thumb, thumbs up. <laughs> oh, and my. I took the aircraft up to it over. No instrumentation at all. The first flight of the S seventy six with no one minute and fourteen seconds and no data whatsoever. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. That, that's... Cheered. We landed the aircraft and we made our milestone. <laughs> Nick, you're you you're a hero. You're 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 a freaking hero, man. I'm I'm uh I love talking to aviators and, and uh people like this that that lead the way in aviation. Man, I, I can't wait till our audience hears this. If you're listening to this podcast right now, you've got to understand that you know, Nick is one of the frontier helicopter test pilots in the world. Um, and, and thank you for, again for joining us, Nick. Man. <laughs> hey, it's my pleasure. It's my great pleasure. W would you like to promote anything? Uh, um, well, uh, let me say this. Uh, you know, people have asked about Sikorsky and about Lockheed. As you know, that uh, Sikorsky left the United Technologies and was bought by Lockheed. And uh, I have to tell you that the, the tales that I'm telling you about Sikorsky, I know that Lockheed is the same ones. These, these companies um, uh, run back Lockheed, the Lockheed brothers, and Glenn Martin helped invent the things that we, that we fly with. And what we've discovered at Sikorsky is that now that we work with and for Lockheed Martin, we work for a company that knows what we do. They understand us right to the right to the very soles of our shoes, and it's a it's a terrific uh, opportunity for us. And I know that the engineers and pilots at Sikorsky all all think like I do. Absolutely awesome, um, Mr. Nick. Nick, no, <laughs> I can't even talk anymore. Nick Lapos <laughs> is, uh, yeah, one of the great storytellers. Nick about uh, 
you know, now I've got so much stuff to research and get back into about the history of, uh, <laughs> you know, Sikorsky aircraft. I've been I've been focusing mostly on warbirds from World War II lately, but uh, you know, my roots were in helicopters as I entered the aviation community in the in the uh, Sikorsky H three. I flew the Gulf model and the Hotel model. Um, oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah, beautiful airplane. And by the way, what a, what a queen! What a beautiful machine! I and it's amazing when you think that the that that first flew in 1959. I know. And that and that the generation previous had wooden blades. <laughs> look at the look at the enormous uh, technological leap that the 61 presented. Yeah, it was fantastic. What a great airplane! I I, I was able to uh, participate in 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 the relief efforts of Hurricane Andrew with that airplane, uh, that helicopter. Oh yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, by far, everybody wanted us. You know why? Because it's such a massive airplane that you could fit so many things in it. Um, you know. And, and deliver so many goods to and, and help out so many people. Um, the H sixty not so big, but uh, it had a different purpose. Um, yeah, so, that's right. Yep. But uh, Nick, thank you very much for talking with us tonight. Um, Pete, thanks for having me. I I really want to have you back on the show and talk about the other airplanes. <laughs> well, you got more tales. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, producer Steve, uh, you're still in Florida. Yes, I am. Yeah. Producer Steve's in Florida. I guess uh, Nick, you and Steve know each other from the uh, associations there. And, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Steve, can you can you make sure Nick comes on the show again? I'll do my best. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Um, if you love this episode and all the episodes, uh, you know, leave a comment or or leave us a five star or even a four star, uh, you know, rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play music and now on spotify uh that would help us climb the charts help us get the word out and uh help us grow our audience in the aviation aerospace industries um we'll talk to you soon thanks for listening at www.thehangardeck.com <laughs>